Well, good morning to you all, and I pray you had a blessed week as I have had. Um, this morning's readings, I, I really want to look at, uh, the marriage of Cana is, is phenomenal in its first miracle with Christ, but I think that we need to look at, as, as a church that's growing, as a church that's uh, trying to uh, get its ducks in a row of sorts, we need to look at uh, 1 Corinthians 12. 1 Corinthians 12 is one of Paul's most powerful discussions about what we are as the body of Christ. We've heard this past week in the media about discussions where one of the presidential candidates had brought up a discussion about the body of Christ needs to come forward, and they didn't understand. And, and so in this, it really came to me this story of one, uh, of one time that was given to us at seminary about... Uh, uh, it was a Pizza Hut in Chicago, uh, the company that makes the bread or the, the uh, dough for the pizza is made somewhere else. They don't make it at uh, the stores itself. And when they were putting the pizza dough together, somehow or another the person that was making it all together added too much yeast. And, and, and not to the point of saying, okay, instead of two tablespoons he added three. It was, I mean, these were pounds and pounds of yeast in the amount of uh, dough that they made. Well, the yeast, yeast is something that if you make beer or if you make bread, you understand how this powerful thing that you keep in the refrigerator to keep it dormant, once you warm it up and you add it to flour or you add it to uh, wort, it starts doing some powerful stuff. Well, anyway, this tractor trailer that finally the police had to pull it over, because yeast was pouring out the, uh, or dough was pouring out the back of the truck all along the routes in, in uh, Chicago, the interstates, they just had this yeast, the, the sides of the truck were bulging out, that's how powerful yeast is. <coughs> and we as Christians, according to what Paul's talking about here, we are a lot like yeast, or we need to be a more like yeast. We keep ourselves from spoiling by a pious life and by study, but that's not re really what God calls us to be, does he? I mean, studying is part of it, being pious is part of it, but we really need to mix with the leaven, or the, the unyeasted bread, of the lost world around us. And we need to start a reaction so that the whole world can come to life in Christ. If you've ever made beer, especially, uh, I, I taught Barry how to make beer one day, and we're sitting there in our kit, in Mary's and I kitchen, and we're mixing up beer. And I said, "Okay, now this is wort, and this is dead. There's nothing to it right now. There's nothing in this beer that's going to make it alive right now. All it is, is is just sugar molecules that are perking up and being boiled. But once I add this yeast, it's going to come to life. It's going to it's going to pop. It's going to have alcohol in it. It's going to trigger all the sugars." to change all the flavor over, and that's what yeast does. And we as Christians, we need to be that same way because the world is really like leavened bread, like matzah. If, you, I, if you've ever had matzah, there's no yeast in it. It's just dough that's baked without any yeast. It hasn't come to life like bread. We, are, as Christians, are called to bring our ideal of Christ-oriented life into every situation every situation into every and all of our environments but to do in the spirit of love we need to be accompanied by an apostolic prayer and lastly but most importantly is apostolic action and we fail at that we fail at that why because of fear fear we are called by name, just as the early disciples from different backgrounds. Each of us comes from different experiences, different belief systems. And we come together with Christ, and he calls, and he takes time with each and every one of us so that we take time to be with our Lord, to share with each other, to grow in Christ, to become Christians dedicated to a life of piety, study, and action. But that action should be planned, it should be motivated by love of God, and a neighbor, not just a desire to do good. 
And this is a lot of, if you study philosophy, this really is Kant, what he was really saying where we've killed religion in many ways is because we looked at loving thy neighbor and loving God as an end, to do good as an end. But really, in reality, it's got to be a means, a way that we live. I remembered a comment that my son Will had said to me many years ago when, when we first started going to Disneyland all the time. And he would look over at, at Mary and say, you know, I hate going here with Dad because he talks to everybody. And Will's the, the opposite. He, he'd rather keep to his own privacy, leave me alone. You know, I mean, he's that type of person in a plane that you'd love to sit next to compared to me. Because I'll talk up about a conversation about anything. But I love Disneyland, I think, as most of us do, for that simple reality that we lose track of reality. We act like children. When we see Mickey Mouse out there, we want to get our picture taken with Mickey Mouse. I remember Mary seeing uh, uh, Mary Poppins, and she smiled from ear to ear, and she wanted her picture taken with Mary Poppins. And, and that's really what our experience as Christians should be like. Regardless, when we go to Disney, I'm not afraid to talk to anyone. Just as in here, I'm not afraid to talk to any of you. But we need to watch because in our small groups, we've also taken that that we're not afraid to proclaim Christ's name in public, in a restaurant, in a, in a library, in, in wherever it is. We need to be more like that, to talk and have candid discussions about who Christ is in our lives. Because Satan just loves for us to be frightened in today's world, to keep our faith quiet so we don't, quote unquote, offend someone. I believe the opposite of love is not hate. It isn't hate. The opposite of love is fear fear. And it's fear that keeps us from stepping out and doing the right thing. It's fear that keeps us from perceiving by others the fear that we might be considered odd or different. I sometimes wish others would see my discussions not with fear, but as courage. I need to draw from this courage in my own Christian walk, as most of you do. We need to be willing to step out and to do God's work, even in the presence of fear. I often say that the Christians should be a lot like Plato's discussion about the cave, his discourse that he has about light and darkness, that Christ used that same analogy of sorts, that we are the light of the world, that we want to draw others to us, that we want to teach others on how and who and why and where Christ is in our lives. And not let fear separate us from God's calling for each of us. But we are held responsible if we do not fulfill that mission. And, and this comes into a discussion that we had once before with Brett, and he brings it up so poignantly. I mean, if we were doctors, would we feel a great responsibility because we would be dealing with something that could, that could be a matter of life and death? If we were entrusted with millions of dollars, we would be careful we, on how we invested it, wouldn't we? But as followers of Christ, we should feel the responsibility even more because we have our hands, we have in our hands the most precious thing in the world, more precious than the million dollars, more precious than the, than the ideals of a doctor. It is this pearl of great price worth selling all for. And we are dealing with something that could be and is, for the most part, eternal life or eternal death. As the discussion came up last week that we are mandated in, in especially those who have not heard Christ so that they do not have damnation for eternity, to spread the word of the gospel of love, to spread the word of gospel of Christ, of understanding. And I think the, the prophet Ezekiel says it the best when he points out in Ezekiel 3, he says this, When I say to the wicked, you shall surely die, and you do not warn him or speak to warn him, that wicked man shall die in his inequity, but his blood I will require at your hand. 
Yes, you can go home after our time here together today and not do a thing. Be a homebody. Go and, and drink at your local pub all by yourself in your corner. But the loss, be, and, 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 and if you do that, if you do that, if you just go home, I, it will not take away this passage of Scripture whatsoever. But if you do, it, it will not relieve you, though, of the responsibility that we have as Christians. It will not. The mission of the church is great, and I tell you, the world is not lost because there are too many pagans out there. Too many pagans. And some may say, well, no, Bill, you know, th th this, this is a, a country that was based on, on God and it'll die. But no, that's not right. That's not true. There's so many people out there that call themselves, quote unquote, Christians who do not believe in the saving grace of Christ. And it was spot on this morning with our discussion that we as Anglicans need to profess to the world exactly who Christ is and how come we came about instead of staying in where we were. <laughs> We moved out. We moved out so that we could proclaim the gospel openly without persecution from our own people. And now we need to be on guard as Anglicans that it's our own people that are keeping us from spreading the gospel. The world is mainly non-Christian by default. That's the way I feel. Remember that in that reading Christ said, you are the salt of the earth, the light of the world. What do you do, no matter how small it may seem, to make a difference is the question I bring to you. It makes a difference not only about life, but really about that last part, that apostolic uh, action. That makes the difference in the church. Did you know, as I looked up in a few versions of the Bible, the statement, fear not or be not afraid, is in Scripture 365 times. 365 times. So that means in some versions of the Bible, every day of your life, the Lord is speaking to you about your fear. What about telling your friends, your neighbors, and so forth about Christ? Is there somebody in your life that you need to tell who Christ is? This is my, I guess of sorts, ideal for you. Before you go and talk to your friend, you need to talk to God about your friend. Before you talk to that friend, I need you to talk to God about your friend. So that the Holy Spirit may open up a conversation. Now in Paul's letter here, we, we come back to that old childhood thing. You remember this thing? Here's the church and here's the steeple. Go inside and here's all the people. You remember that we learned in Sunday school? You all remember that? No, you never did that before. Here's a church, here's a steeple. We need to really look at that that's really not this part is the church, but that this is the church. We are a people that, can, can, that constitute the church that Jesus has founded. We need to stay in contact with other brothers and sisters that maybe have been led astray, that maybe not here anymore. By brothers and sisters, I mean fellow apostles in whom you can share our apostolic action. Men and women who are striving to live the same kind of life that we are. What kind of life do you live as a Christian? If somebody were to ask you, what would be your main thing? I think that we need to live a life in grace. And that's the main ideal. And grace is that you're in the church, that it begins with you. The church cannot fulfill its mission unless you act, unless you act. Now, I'm going to close with this cute story that I thought was funny. Um, and, and, and it came to me uh, through uh, a pretty funny book, but it, it's, anyway, uh, it's called One Inch uh, uh, one inch from the fence. I don't know if you've ever read that book before. Um, and the title of a short discourse is called Kissing Frogs. Kissing Frogs. And it reads like this. Ever feel like a frog? Frogs are slow, low, ugly, puffy, drooped, pooped. I know. One told me. The frog feeling comes when you want to be bright, but you feel dull. 
You want to share, but you're selfish. You want to be thankful, but you're resentful. You want to be big, but you're small. You want to care, but you're different. You're indifferent, I mean. Yes, at one time or another, each of us has found ourselves on a lily pad, haven't we? Floating down that great river of life, frightened and disgusted to be too darn froggish to budge. The rest of the fairy tale it goes on like this. Once upon a time there was a frog, but he was not really a frog. He was a prince who looked like a frog. And this wicked witch had cast a spell on him, and only the kiss of a beautiful young maid would come save him. But since when do cute women kiss frogs? So he sat, an unkissed prince in a frog form, and ah, but a miracle happens. One day, this beautiful maiden grabbed him and gave him one big smack on the lips. Crash, boom, zap. He became, he was that handsome prince. Well, you know the rest of the story. They lived happily ever after, right? The Lord defines us what frogs we are kissing. Now, I'm not saying that your spouse is a frog. Please don't get me that way. But there are a lot of frogs out there for us to kiss in way of sharing the story of Jesus Christ. There's a lot of frogs out there who are widowed, orphaned, hungry, thirsty, a stranger, naked, ill, even in prison. These are frogs that we are instructed to kiss by Christ. Now here the thing that is so tremendous about being a follower of Christ, there is in no way that each of us individually can kiss all the frogs out there in the world, can we? There's no way. If you remember the 1 Corinthians reading that we read this morning, we are all members of one body and all have a particular function to serve. If you think about the physical body, it's ridiculous to think of the toe that seeds or a knee that takes, or an arm that walks. So it is with the body of Christ, each of us is called into a particular part or body function in our role. The Lord definitely does not expect us to fill every role, but we are mandated to follow that one role that Christ calls us to. Because our mission then, as, as brothers and sisters in Christ, is to go out and find our own particular kind of frog and kiss it. Now this morning I handed out to each of you a spiritual direction or a spiritual gifts form of sorts. And in there I've taken a couple different sources and put them all together for you. You'll see one page that you actually have to fold in half and then go back and fill in each one of the boxes that you feel led. And I, I really prayed over these forms as I put them together for you and I, I want you to sit and do a spiritual survey. You may have never done that before. You may think that you're called to be an apostle. You may, or, or not apostle, but a, 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 a prophet. And, and, but that really, when you take that spiritual survey, it may not come to pass. We took Alpha Course and there was a gentleman there who says, you know, I've done this survey and the only thing that I see that I'm really good at is cooking. So then your ministry is to food and fellowship. So don't always look at that you don't maybe don't have all these qualifications to understand and, and decipher uh, scripture. You may not have the understanding to do and to follow, uh, let's say, the, the rubrics on the altar. So you're not called to be a priest, but you may have the calling of prayer. So please take this survey as serious as you can. Really pray through it. Pray before you take it. Pray after you take it. Pray through each one of the questions. It's not a Myers-Briggs of sorts, but it is a Myers-Briggs of sorts. And you can taint it when you say, well, I've always wanted to be, uh, I've always wanted to be more holy. So I'm going to say, yes, I read the Bible a lot. When all you do is maybe a couple verses a day. Uh, so really take it seriously as you go through this. And let's come back together with it and come to me about it. And let's look at where you're called in as we grow as a church. We're going to have a lot of ministries that open up. So where are you called to what frogs are you called to kiss? That's really where we need to look at with this thing. And I think this is a good guide over and opposed to uh, what we perceive sometimes or want of ourselves. But <clears throat> it's not a reality what God wants for us. So pray about this this week as we grow and see our gifts grow, uh, that how can we enhance those gifts that God has given you.
In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.